resource there. Again, I'm Jana and I am the farm director over at Adama. We are a farm on BB Hill Road in Falls Village and we grow organic, certified organic vegetables for our CSA, which is a program, I'll put a, a little link in the chat. Um, I know we're all gardeners here, but if you um, want some supplemental veggies or you um, also just know folks in your community that might be interested in the CSA, we do weekly and every other week auctions for getting a box of organic local vegetables, everything that's in season. So you can check that out. And we also grow for the Isabella Friedman Jewish Retreat Center where we're located. And as Meg said, we do a lot of food access work, making sure that everyone in our community has access to fresh organic vegetables. We have about three acres of organic veggies in production over there on BB Hill. We do some other things because we do a lot of educational programming. So we have um, a small herd of goats, um, some sheep, we have an agroforestry project, which just means when we're growing an agricultural system that involves trees. And so we have 200 chestnut trees planted on BB Hill. Um, we have an eclectic mix of um, all different kinds of, of, uh, of plants going on over there. We also make our own compost. So we not only take all the food waste from um, the retreat center, but we also um, accept deliveries. The Salisbury School, the boys school um, is, they, they have a project where the boys are gathering up their food waste and bringing it to our compost piles. We collect every, twice a week, we collect from the Kellogg School in Falls Village. Um, and we invite you, you are welcome and invited to, if you have been wanting to compost your food scraps, but haven't, um, and, but don't have composting down in your yard, although we'll, we'll talk about that today yet, and you want to drop off your scraps, you're also welcome to use that as a resource. Um, a little bit about me, and then I'm going to um, share a little more sort of my approach to vegetable growing, and then I really want our time together to be focused on your questions, because as Meg said, who knows, you know, what you're struggling with, we're all in the same region, so we may be struggling with some of the same things as one another. Um, a little about, about, about me. So I came to Adama um, 11 years ago now. I had been farming in different areas of the country at uh, organic, mostly vegetable, but also flower farms around um, really, truly across the country in different places. And I had decided that I really wanted to settle in the Northeast. And um, when I was looking for a job managing a farm, um, Adama was one of the options. And when I arrived at Isabel Friedman, um, as folks who've, who've been there, who have um, you know, participated in some of our educational programs before will know it's just such an incredibly warm and welcoming um, place and I just knew that it, it was my home. I had been raised Jewish, although I wasn't particularly engaged at the time. And, is, and Adama um, does a lot of programming, um, Jewish um, land education programming. And so that connection became um, really wonderful for me too. And um, while we are at a Jewish retreat center, a lot of our programming is um, complete, you know, not, not related to that. And um, everyone is welcome, everyone is welcome in our CSA. And we really have a mission around um, sustainable sustainability and um, making sure that people have feel comfortable on land and learn what it means to engage with soil and, and grow food and um, be a part of community. So that's a little about me, a little about Adama. I'm gonna share my screen and do a, a little bit of a slideshow presentation and I am gonna rush through it. So feel free to throw your questions in, in the chat if there are things that come up as I go, but I'm gonna rush through it because I wanna introduce some concepts um, while also, again, as I said, I really want the bulk of this time to be able to be um, for questions and discussion. I also made up a little handout. So I'm putting a link in the chat to that handout. Feel free to open that now or you know, or to look at it later, it may be distracting because there's a lot of words on there, but I just put essentially a glossary of a lot of the terms that I think are really 
um, helpful and important. Also, just um, I'm sure that no matter who's in the room today, we have a wide range of um, folks. We may have master gardeners who've been vegetable gardening for, you know, their whole lives and, and have so much to teach us all. And we may have folks who haven't started yet and that's perfect. So hopefully we'll be able to share our knowledge and, um, and be a good, good session for all of us. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share screen. And we'll start off with this term regenerative. So the um, term regenerative is really a way of thinking about um, thinking about land's potential to host life from year to year. So we have the word organic, right? We know that organic means there aren't chemicals being used and that we're increasing the health of the soil. Um, and we have the word sustainable and we have the word biological. We have a lot of different words for the approach and it doesn't matter what word we're using. Um, but we know that a lot of these, this type of approach to land, these types of practices um, originate in, you know, many thousands of years of indigenous growing practices and that we have that we are, there's just so much wisdom out there for ways of growing food that um, rather than simply sustaining what was there before that build soil store carbon we know we have a problem where we have a little too much carbon in the atmosphere we want to put some more of it into the soil increasing biodiversity and maximizing photosynthesis these are the general principles that we run our farm on and that I wanna share a little bit about with you all today. And we have an image here of some perennial grasses and some deep, deep um, rich soil. And we see how far down the roots are going. So how in our vegetable growing practices, how do we mimic this type of ecosystem where we have really stable soil, we have really healthy soil. Any organic grower will tell you um, to feed the soil, not the crop. So of course we have the option of having a vegetable and sort of, imagining it as um, uh, in, in a lab or a factory and sort of giving exactly what it needs right in its roots. Or we have this approach where we say, if we have a really healthy soil food web, if we have lots of healthy things going on in the soil, then we are going to have strong plants. And those strong plants are gonna outcompete pests and they're gonna outcompete diseases. Um, and so really giving that attention to the soil is a big part of our approach. I like this quote from Elliot Coleman in The New Organic Grower. He says, why and how do plants grow? Why and how do they fail? Why do plants seem to grow successfully for some people in some places and not others? The answer lies in those factors that affect the growth of plants. They include light, moisture, temperature, soil fertility, mineral balance, biotic life, weeds, pests, seeds, labor, planning, and skill. The grower can influence some of these factors more than others. The more they can be arranged to the crop's liking, however, the more successful the grower's operation will be. And I like this quote because it really reminds us that as, as gardeners, we are um, tending to all of the conditions around the plant. And the more we can make them suitable to whatever the plant as it was originally bred to be adapted to likes, um, the, the happier our plant is going to be. Um, so in the handout that I put in the chat already, um, you'll see, and I think a few folks have joined us, so we can, we can post that again. Um, if you want to look through that after, especially if you're new to gardening, but even if you're not, it sort of goes through some of these, um, these factors that are listed in this quote here. And, and how do you approach a site and think about the light, the moisture, the temperature, the soil fertility? How do you look at your space and figure out where you um, need to get your space in order to be hospitable to those plants? And this is just a little view of our, our farm. You'll get to see lots of different pictures from, from our farm. So how do we do that? One of the number one approaches, I will always say, um, over and over again is increasing soil organic matter. We have these two pictures here on the right. We have a soil that doesn't have a lot of soil organic matter. And on the left, we have a soil that does have a lot of organic matter. And that organic matter is gluing the soil together so that we don't have a big puddle of sort of um, uh, grains 
at the bottom, but rather we have good structure. And that's gonna be the basis for lots and lots of living things as we see in this cartoon of a soil food web where everything is eating everything else. That's what we wanna get. How do we get good soil organic matter? We add really good compost. The better the compost, the better your um, crops. I often, you know, people say, oh, I had an issue this year with this pest and I'll say more compost. I had an issue this year with this disease, more compost. I had an issue where it grew too slowly or it looked funny or more compost. That's, that's the shortcut to some of the things that we'll talk about today. The shortcut is more compost. And the reason is what I spoke about before, feeding the soil is, is the number one thing you can do. If, you're, if your soil is super healthy, you're gonna be um, set up in a way that your plant is gonna outgrow disease, outgrow pests, um, all of those different pieces. What else can you do? You can reduce soil disturbance. So what I mean by that is, if we look here at this image on the left, we have a farmer plowing a field. He's using horses, but he has, you know, on the back there, he has a shank that's just sort of a metal scoop and it has flipped the soil. And look how that soil is just um, caked like that. So when we do that, when we disturb our soil, we're doing a lot of different things. One, we're often integrating whatever was there before. So that's a good thing. There are good reasons sometimes to disturb the soil, but we also have to know that there are also um, detrimental effects. So we're, um, we're messing up the soil structure. We're releasing carbon. Again, we've got a little too much of that in the air. So we, we wanna keep that carbon in the soil. Um, we are disturbing those microbes that we looked at in the cartoon. We're disturbing that soil food web. Um, and we are, um, wh whenever we don't have things alive in the soil for any period of time, we're um, again, kind of interrupting that soil food web. So let's talk a little bit about ways to avoid um, disturbing the soil. We have an image here on the right. This is just an exciting project, uh, which is this image is from the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas, and they are breeding perennial grain. So if we look on the right, we have traditional annual wheat. Look how shallow the roots are. They're very shallow. And so they're not adding much organic matter to the soil. They're not holding the soil in place in, in a huge way. Whereas here, we have these deep, 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 deep roots of a perennial wild wheat ancestor. Not as easy to harvest. There are some, some issues we have to work out in plant breeding to um, bring this type of grain to scale as a basis for our, our um, the grain that we eat. But in terms of soil health and in terms of keeping carbon in the soil, and, and the regenerative nature of this farming system, it's just huge, look at these roots. So that's what we're going for in general. In our vegetable gardening systems, we are looking for ways to um, keep soil intact, keep roots healthy, all of those pieces. So we're gonna keep the soil covered as much as possible. This is a picture, um, one time on our farm, we did a little experiment with different ways of covering the soil. So um, this, area on the right we had a black tarp and that works pretty well for shading out weeds of course it's plastic and you know maybe plastic isn't what we want more of it in our lives uh, but it is very effective so even just literally garbage bags you know if you have garbage bags and you put them down on top of the soil rather than digging up the soil to disturb it to start your vegetables anew this is a way of keeping the soil covered and reducing, reducing disturbance. But of course, we also have organic materials we can use. These are wood chips. We have a wonderful resource of uh, municipal um, wood chips over at the transfer station that we can get. We have leaves here. We are so grateful to everyone around town who drops their leaves off in our um, compost yard because we use them and, and they're a wonderful resource that's in all of our landscapes. And we have hay here. And I think the back one was a different type of hay. So we did a little experiment. And of course, each of those materials breaks down at a different pace and is gonna add different types of microbes to the soil. And so while certain ones have certain advantages over other ones, I say the more organic matter you can get on the soil, the better, the more you can keep it covered, the better. Um, we want to increase the mycorrhizal relationships. Mycorrhizal fungi are fungi that 
create relationships with plants. And you can see in this picture on the left that we have these uh, plant roots, these pine seedling roots are, are only a small part of the picture. And then all these white, this white network, these are the hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi that are in relationship with the plant roots. And they have so much more contact with the surface area of the soil that they are able to feed the crop water and nutrients that the, the, the plant, in this case a pine seedling, but in our cases, um, vegetable crops won't otherwise have access to. And then the picture on the right, you can see these turnips. And then we have these little bird's eye mushrooms coming up and that's a good sign that we have good fungal life in our soil. And that, that um, fungal life, the best way to keep it going is to keep plants growing in your soil. Every time we disturb the soil and then have bare soil for any period of time, we're depriving those fungi of their relationships. So you can inoculate your soil with these type of um, fungi and you can just go online and look up, you know, mycorrhizal inoculant for vegetables. Um, but the, the, the hyphae are probably somewhere in your soil and, and the best way to keep them going is lots of compost and lots of growing plants going all the time in your soil. We can plant cover crops. This picture on the left, we have um, uh, bare soil in the front. Don't worry, we actually had some cover crop seeds in there. So we're about to sprout some cover crops. Cover crops are just plants that are meant to enrich the soil. You're not necessarily harvesting them, but you're um, enriching the soil with them. And in the back, we have a cover crop that has already come up. And you can imagine if there are fungi in the soil that need to be in relationship with plants in order to thrive, any period of time looking like this is going to be bad for those fungi. So we don't want that. We want mulch on that soil. We want cover crops coming up on that soil. We want, um, even if it's a tarp, a plastic tarp, we want that covering the soil. We want something to protect the soil from the rain, from the wind, all those pieces. Um, and then we can fix our own nitrogen. What does that mean? We know that nitrogen is a very important nutrient for vegetable plants. We can apply that nitrogen um, with fertilizers that are manufactured and that'll the plants will enjoy that. But we can also grow our own by planting legumes. And this is a legume root that has these nodules. These, this is a relationship between um, rhizobia bacteria and nitrogen fixing legumes um, that put nitrogen, take it from the atmosphere and put it down into the soil. So that was a lot of science very quickly, but the, the gist of it is that if you plant beans, if you plant anything in the legume family, peas, those, especially if you add an inoculant to the um, seed, when you put it in, you're gonna um, be bringing a lot of nitrogen into the soil in a way that plant roots can take, take up. What else can we do? Um, so this is no longer, we're no longer on our soil health. We're generally just in crop health. We want to attract beneficial insects. This is a, an image of one of our, some of our vegetable beds. And we planted marigolds um, at the head of each bed. And those were, those are attracting beneficial insects that then are predators of our crop pests. So that is a really important tool in the toolbox. We want to plant varieties that are well adapted to our climate. So if we are planting something that just really has a hard time with our, with our humidity or with our um, you know, colder temperatures in the spring or hot temperatures in the summer, we're gonna um, just gonna be an uphill battle. So we wanna go ahead and try and find the best adapted varieties. And of course here we have a wonderful community of growers um, that can uh, we can share those that kind of information. Like, what what varieties do you love? What what works really well in our northwest Connecticut corner? Um, and then diverse, diversity, of course, is an important one. So having different vegetables. Uh, if we're growing just one thing and we have a terrible year for that one thing, um, that's that's the end. But it, you know, the more different types of things we're growing together, the more the more resilient we're going to be. Okay, so that was just a quick snapshot of sort of my framework for how I think about growing vegetables. Um, and, and now I would love to kind of dive into people's particular interests and, and what, um, what folks are wondering. And you can go ahead and just toss 
your questions or your thoughts in the chat, and then we can um, sort of launch our conversation in that direction. And I'm going to go ahead and read a couple of the things that are already in here and feel free just even if it, it could be the most very specific question that you have like my zucchini dropped their flowers last year anybody have any thoughts um or it could be very general you know a big picture like what does that mean soil erosion why is that relevant to me as a vegetable gardener so barbara says i don't understand about when you are covering the soil and how that reduces soil disturbance okay thank you good good question so i would say it's two things um Reducing by reducing soil disturbance, what I mean is not digging into the soil. Now, let's say we have, let's say we're starting off with grass, we're starting off with sod, or imagine that you're just starting off with last year's, um, uh, um, uh, let's say you were growing, what's a good example? Let's say you were growing flowers last year, and you're not sure what, you know, how, how are we going to turn this area into a blank space for the next crop. And um, one way would be to dig into the soil, right? To mix up the soil, to take that sod and flip it over so that we can um, start afresh with new, new crops. And we might do that with a rototiller, we might do it with a shovel. But another way to do it is just to shade out the grass. So to say, I'm not going to dig into the soil, I'm not going to disturb the living things there, but actually I'm just going to allow the grass to rot in place by depriving it of light. And you can deprive it of light for with, you know, like I said, a, you know, a black plastic tarp is very, very effective, but so, so are organic matter options if you're doing them very deep. So if you have wood chips this deep on top of sod, the sod will die. It'll take a long time. It, it, it might take you know, six months, it might take a full, you know, half the summer, full, full summer. Um, so you want to be thinking ahead with that method, but that would be a way to reduce soil disturbance. Um, covering the soil separately just has other benefits, meaning even once you're already growing vegetables, if you add a mulch on top, um, if you have, you know, especially when they're small, vegetables don't take up very much space. And then as they get bigger, they need the whole space. So picture a tomato plant when it goes in, it might just be like, you know, hopefully a nice healthy seedling from the Hunt Library plant sale. And you have a, a nice big seedling there, but it's going to need a lot of space over the course of the season. This is one um, error that I see vegetable gardeners make a lot. You know, when you put it in, it's a small plant and you're excited and you're ambitious and it's spring and you're so excited for things to grow. And so you put a lot in there, but you have to remember that the plant needs soil. It needs space to grow. So you don't want to overcrowd things. So what do you do while the plants are small? You want to keep the soil covered either with a mulch or sometimes you can also do what's called intercropping. Take a plant like a tomato plant that's going to be in the ground for a long time and then add some little radishes around it, let's say. You're covering, you're keeping the soil covered with those radishes. You're keeping those mycorrhizal relationships up with the radishes. Um, you're photosynthesizing and plus then you get your radishes, which are an underrated vegetable in my opinion. Um, so I hope that helps to answer that question. It, thanks for helping me tease that out. It's, a, it's kind of a couple different things there. And Sharon says, years ago when I had my vegetable garden soil tested by Yukon, they told me, oh, Oh, no account should, on no account I sh should I add any more organic matter to my soil. I laid off top dressing with compost for a year, but since then have added every year. Am I making a mistake? Good question. Um, I'm so curious why they said that. If you're, you must be in a bit of a low spot with some clay soil, um, it may be, you know, wet. Um, I mean, my question would be um, how your vegetables are growing. If when you're adding compost, you're, you're ending up with some, some good, healthy looking veggies, then you're probably in good shape. If you're right on a waterway, you know, if you're planting somewhere really wet, we can pollute with too much organic matter. You know, the phosphorus in particular is high in something like compost or manure. And if we're adding every year tons and tons of it, we can um, contribute to phosphorus runoff, which is not something we want to do. That said, most of our gardens are a small enough scale that that probably isn't a huge issue. Um, and Sharon says that she's up high, not wet at all, and most vegetables do 
well most of the time. So yeah, I'm so curious about that recommendation not to add organic matter. But if you're having good results with your compost, then, and it sounds like there's not a concern for phosphorus pollution, um, if I were you, I would keep doing what you're doing. Because yeah, um, and and maybe ask that question again. You know, send off for a soil test again and see if you get a similar answer. And 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 just sort of inquire why. What what does that mean? What, um, yeah. Um, and this is a good question. Should I remove all Asian jumping worms from my garden soil? It's a good question. I don't know the answer to because I don't have experience with those. Um, I have heard about them but I don't, I don't know. But you know what's a great resource um, always is Yukon Extension. So um, you can always reach out to their, you know, if you just Google Yukon Extension, you'll, you'll come up with the vegetable specialist. And um, they are, in my experience, always um, very happy to answer, answer questions. So sorry, I don't know the answer to that one. And Barbara asks, are raised beds a poor choice for vegetable gardening? Is it harder to maintain soil hearth? Oh, great question. I don't think they're a poor choice at all. I think there are a lot of benefits to raised beds. Of course, they can make the um, space more accessible. You know, it can be hard to bend all the way down to the soil. So it can be really nice to raise them up a little bit. Um, and you can also have a little more control over what's there. You can bring in, it can just be a bit expensive to bring in all that good, healthy soil and as much compost as you need. But I think that they're, um, I don't think it's harder to maintain soil health. I mean, but the, we do want to, at Isabella Friedman, we have a few um, big raised beds and I have struggled with the amount that they, you do kind of have to keep adding soil over time, especially in, in our area where we get some big rain events. Um, so that can be a factor. So again, it can be expensive to keep adding soil. Um, I'm very much a in the ground growing um, enthusiast, enthusiast, but not because it's better, only because it's, it's um, to me, I just love sort of starting with a blank slate and then adding that organic matter in so many different ways um, is so exciting to me, you know, working with what's already there, but that's sort of just, just what I find fun. Um, I think that, raised beds are, are a great choice. And, and again, if you have access to soil that you can bring in and lots of compost that you can bring in to add to them, then they can, you can have really great high soil health in raised beds, in raised beds too. Thank you. Okay, Maura asks, what is the best way to handle the little green worms that eat kale and Brussels sprouts and broccoli? Great question. Those are usually, um, I'm assuming you're talking about cab cabbage loopers. We also get them. There are a couple ways to deal with them. One is to um, use row cover. I really like using row cover. Um, it is available on a, on a garden scale. Um, we also have a garage full of it. So if you just need a little bit, come by. I'll give you some of our you know, old row cover that you can reuse, but you can, you can buy it at, um, look online for um, gardening row cover. And what it is, is just a thin fabric that allows light and water in um, but excludes pests. So for our most um, uh, determined pests, and I would include the cabbage looper in that category, the cabbage looper and the flea beetle. Those are the two, and sometimes cucumber beetles. Those are the three that we really deal with um, extensively or, or are the most difficult for us in, on our vegetable farm. And we do exclude them with row covers. So sometimes, certain times a year you come by a farm and it looks like we're just growing a bunch of white blankets. And the reason is because we cover so many things with this fabric to exclude pests. Um, and then of course, you you know, once the plant is is large enough, you, you take the cover off and they're off to the races and they're not so susceptible to the pests as much. Okay, so that's idea number one. Idea number two is BT, Bactylothorensis, if you do want to spray something, this is an organic approved spray. Um, so it is not a toxic chemical. It is a bacteria. Um, and it, it is, you know, yeah, I think of the, I'm not a big insecticide person, but of the insecticides, I think it's a relatively innocuous one. Um, 
and you can you can buy it you know in any garden center and spray it and the reason why i think it's it's relatively innocuous is because it's very targeted to caterpillars it doesn't harm bees and it doesn't harm any other insects that um, might be present because of course the the best thing we can do for pest control is to have a wide biodiversity of insects the more different kinds of bugs we have in our our garden the the healthier our plants are going to be because so many um, pests are predated upon by um, by predator insects and so when we have um, habitat so sometimes that means rotting logs and sometimes that means um, bunch grasses, but when we have habitat, and of course we are so lucky in our area to have so much wild space where we do have um, good habitat for, for predator insects. And when we have nectar sources, so um, that's a good reason to plant those, um, those flowers that attract pollinators and beneficial insects. When we have those two things, we often have more balance among our pests. That said, I think we have some really good balance on our farm and we still do get those little green worms. So um, row cover, BT, those are, those are the best options that I can think of. Um, and Barbara says, we have problems with caterpillars on our brassicas. What brassicas, what does that indicate? Those are the, I'm guessing they're the little green ones. Um, that's, those are the, the, the cabbage loopers. They're the little white um, moth looking, butterfly looking, um ones that we see flying and they're the ones laying those eggs and 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 uh yeah so um it's it's just an indicator that you live in northwest connecticut where we have a bit of a cabbage liver problem <laughs> um but you know again the healthier your soil is so um when you have really healthy robust soil your plants are going to outgrow those caterpillars much much more quickly and more robustly and um, uh, the plants themselves, you know, produce toxins to insects. The plants themselves have some natural defense uh, systems. So again, the stronger and healthier your plants are, the less it's going to be an infestation that really takes down your, your plants, but more something that is easier to handle with something like BT or a, a row cover or even just with a thorough washing. Um, after you harvest. So again, feeding the soil. Um, and so Barbara asks, what do you think of using worm castings? Are they so great and worth the cost? Um, how, and then a question about row cover. So um, as far as worm castings, yeah, I think they're great. I think there are lots of great sources of rich organic matter. Worm castings are a great one. I, I don't, I haven't bought them lately. So I don't, I don't know what the pricing would be. Um, but yes, I, I think they're a, a beautiful, wonderful additive to the soil because what it is, is it's organic matter that has passed through the digestive system of a worm and, um, that conditions the, the soil, it breaks it down and, and you know that you have a rich, wonderful product at the end. So I do think they're an excellent resource. Um, how do you use row covers? Do you use hoops? Do you need to drape? Um, to the ground and adhere really well to keep the bugs out. Yes, to that last question. You do absolutely need it to be um, well sealed with the ground. So we either shovel a little bit of soil on the edge of the row cover to keep it down, which of course that is some soil disturbance. And we talked about that not being always what we're going for. Um, so, so to avoid that, sometimes we'll use sandbags or we'll use, um, uh, you know, rebar, um, things like that. The, the reason why you want it really well sealed is because you don't want the bugs getting under it. So you want a nice good seal with the, the ground, with the row covers. Um, and of course, we live in a place that sometimes gets windy as I don't know if anyone else's windows were rattling last night, but it does get windy. So having it really well placed um, is a, an important important thing to do. Uh, the hoops, the purpose for doing, sometimes what people will do is you'll take a metal hoop and just place it over your garden bed. And then you can put the row cover on top of that in order to um, keep the row cover from touching the plants. That is when you're using row cover as a frost protector, 
So if you if there's a danger of frost and you don't want your plants to, to get frost on them, you do need to use hoops to keep that row cover off because the row cover will actually freeze to the plants and then you've lost the benefit of having your row cover on there. Whereas if you have, and there are different kinds of row cover, there's row cover that's just an insect barrier that won't increase the temperature um, very much underneath it. So if you just want insect protection, look for a row cover that's just insect barrier. And then there's row covers that provide warmth as well. And they will also be a great insect barrier, but they'll also provide some warmth under them. And those ones that provide warmth, that's, that's what people use as a frost protector. And that's when you need the hoops. But generally speaking, if you're not worried about frost and you're just using it for insect protection, you don't need those hoops. You can just allow the fabric to lay right there on the plants and the plants as they grow, they'll just push it up. They're, they're mighty. Um, and Barbara asks, do you keep those on all summer long? It depends on the crop. Anything that needs to be pollinated, so anything with a flower that is a fruiting vegetable, needs to, you need to remove the row cover when the flowers appear. So when we use row cover to exclude cucumber beetles on our cucumbers or um, melons, we have to take it off right away as soon as we see the first flower because you want those to get pollinated. Um, for the brassicas, bra when, I, when we say brassica, we mean that plant family that includes cabbage and kale and broccoli and um, all those yummy things that the little green worms do really love. Um, we, um, uh, yeah, then we, we can leave them on sort of as long as we're concerned about the, the worms and then we take them off. So you can leave them on all the way until harvest. If you have one that is increasing the soil temperature, just be aware of that because brassicas don't love a lot of heat. So if you have, you know, if you really only want to exclude the bugs, try to get one that isn't necessarily a frost protector because then you can leave it on longer. We have issues when we try to put our row covers on um, too long or in the heat of the summer and we're just really kind of frying things under there. So. So that's one thing to consider. Um, and ML says, Asian jumping worms, my understanding is that they deplete topsoil of nutrients and should absolutely be eliminated. Info from Clever Gardeners from the FB group, Expletive Harvests. Um, thank you, yes, great. So lots to look into on Asian jumping worms. Um, so far we haven't had an issue with them, but um, yeah, definitely something to read up on and, and think about. Um, Sharon says, two biggest problems for me are rabbits and Canada thistle. Any suggestions for either? Great question. Oh, those rabbits are so cute and they love vegetables. Um, yeah, I, you know, the, um, there's, there's metal mesh kind of, you know, things that you can install to exclude the rabbits. So depending what you're, if you're growing in raised beds, you can put those over the raised bed. Um, you can, um, you know, you can, there's different kinds of uh, sprays that people put on the soil to try to scare them away um, that have odors that are unpleasant to the rabbits. Um, what else? Everyone throw your, your own ideas in there. Who's struggled with rabbits? Um, uh, and and see, see what, what we come up with. Um, Honestly, row cover is effective. So just that, like I said, the insect barrier, if you wanna cover your plants with that, again, it's not so beautiful in the landscape is, is one pickup with the, with the row cover, but um, it will protect your plants even from rabbits. Um, so yeah, what else on rabbits? The other thing you can do, and this can be um, discouraging, but um, just choosing plants that rabbits don't like so for example, on, um, or especially if there are parts of your garden that the rabbits are getting into more than others. Um, you know, we have an area on our farm where I don't know the rabbits just, that's where they, they like to go. And so we just do not grow carrots there. <laughs> and we, we grow radishes and we grow things that they just aren't interested in. So you may, you know, um, kind of um, adjust what you're growing, especially in rabbit areas. Um, oh, and the other thing is rabbits are scared out in the open. They love to hide in brush. 
So if you can find a way to have it be nice and open right around where you're growing, that could help too, because you may have some lovely bushes or other, you know, kind of hiding spots for rabbits too close to where you're growing. And then they just have a hop, a skip and a jump literally over to your plants. Um, and you want, you want to maybe have a big wide area where they're afraid the coyotes can see them um, around your plants. That, that could help too. Canada thistle, oh gosh, yes. Just, just pulling it out um, uh, and really pulling out the full rhizome. Um, but yeah, once that gets in there, that can be tough. Another issue is, or another potential solution is take, I don't know how big your garden is, but you know, taking an area that's really infested with thistle out of production for a little while and either putting a tarp on it or growing a cover crop, something that um, where you can just keep, uh, you know, um, yeah, if you're using something like a tarp or mulch, something so that it just can't grow and then rotating back into that area once once the thistle um, has been terminated. Um, those are my ideas. I don't know, getting down there and really digging it out is, a, is another option. So Meg has had rot problems with her tomatoes for the last two years. What should I do? More compost. Yeah, more compost is good. Um, more compost, I will never say no to more compost, but probably in general will, will be a big one. We have had some really wet weather. So when we have that wet weather, our tomato um, tomato struggle, is it the roots? The roots or the, the leaves? Um, the leaves, we, we just have a short tomato season in Northwest Connecticut. Um, so for anyone growing tomatoes, just knowing that you wanna get them out there as early, you know, wait till the frost is over. Otherwise, you know, we won't have tomatoes, but as soon as you can getting, again, a really strong plant is gonna make all the difference for tomatoes because you gotta get, get them growing as fast as you can before the August diseases come in. Um, so you can get a good harvest because in August, it's just, we start getting all kinds of fungal disease. Um, so the issue for Meg is the, the fruit rotting. So that's really interesting. Um, it could, I don't know if it's blossom end rot, that can usually be a calcium deficient, deficiency in the soil. When you see a tomato have a, um, a um, little black spot on the bottom where the blossom was, and then it rots from there, that's called blossom end rot. And that's a calcium deficiency in the soil. And usually it's less about needing to add calcium and more about making sure that all the nutrients are accessible to the roots in the soil. So in that case, compost would help um, you know, just a, a overall increased soil health is going to be really beneficial and, and possibly a pH question. So maybe testing your soil pH and, and seeing where that is. Um, we have, we are on this, um, as we know, from our limestone quarries around town and um, from the beauty, beautiful vegetables that we can grow here, we are on an ancient, um, ancient sea beneath us is, um, we call, they call our area the Marble Valley because um, we are on marble, we're on limestone. The, the bedrock underneath our soils is, um, you know, sort of the ancient and very compressed metamorphosed um, shells of ancient sea creatures. And that gives us a very high pH. So our soils, generally speaking, depending where you are, where your garden is, but most of our area, has very high soil pH, meaning it's going to be in the seven range, um, which is good. You know, most most people have to add lime to their gardens in order to get their pH up, but sometimes we have P soil pHs that are a little bit too high, and sometimes we'll add sulfur to bring it down a little bit. So that can sometimes be beneficial to test your soil pH and find out about that. Um, ML's main issue is squirrels and rats devouring the figs. Well, I'm impressed that you have figs. That's exciting. Um, figs are a very tender um, uh, fruit. Are you, um, ML, are you covering your figs in the winter? Um, how are you getting them through the winter? Are, we're sort of like right on the edge. Like, can you grow figs only if you really baby them and, and usually um, and, uh, and, and keep them warm in the winter. 
Oh, squirrels are, we, we have hazelnuts that we just love. They're so delicious and the, the plants are so beautiful and the squirrels love them and they just climb up there and I watch them just one by one right before the hazelnuts are quite at the level that we want them to be. They just take them out. Um, so, um, well, so really I'm just commiserating with you, ML. I'm, <laughs> I don't have a good solution for squirrels. I mean, you can... Oh gosh, on figs, what can you do for the squirrels? Again, the more space you have around the fig, the better because squirrels also are a bit squirrely, a bit, um, you know, nervous in wide open spaces. So that can help. Oh, you're in San Francisco. Wow. Okay. So you're, you're, you're not worrying about, about getting them through the winter as much. Um, hmm. Yeah. Gosh. I guess, you know, going out there and isn't it, they just, they like it. They like them right before you would otherwise want to harvest them. If you could, you know, just staying right on top of the harvest and grabbing them, um, trying to get to them before the squirrels do, that could be a good way. Um, yeah. Yeah. The mammal, the small mammals are, are, um, very tricky depending on how, um, you know, where our gardens are located. If anyone else has had good, good squirrel control, good rabbit control, uh, maybe drop those in there. Um, any other questions before we sort of um, wrap up? Roseanne says, can you address herbs, specifically basil? Yeah. Oh my gosh, love herbs. So we have um, annual herbs and we have perennial herbs. Those are all uh, kind of different growing practices. So for the perennial herbs, meaning herbs that survive the winter and grow year to year, we have, um, uh, they, they're so hardy, you know, you can put some compost down, get a nice fertile soil and sort of leave it for years and they just keep coming back. Uh, as long as we don't harvest them down too hard right before the winter, make sure you're leaving plenty of growth on there before the winter. Basil is an annual herb. So we have other annual herbs too, like dill and cilantro and parsley and all these yummy things. Basil is susceptible to fungus. Um, the, the variety that I've found lately that I like the most, I'll put it in the chat, it's called Everleaf. And it's from, um, Johnny's Selected Seeds, they, they have this variety called Everleaf and it has very short stems. So when we harvest it for our CSA, it, that's um, one thing we don't love about it. It's hard to make a beautiful little bunch of Everleaf basil, but wow, does it resist those funguses. It is um, by far the, the most fungus resistant basil I've ever grown. So if you, if that's your issue, Roseanne, with basil, um, then I recommend that variety. Of course, there are so many delicious, amazing varieties of basil. You can get um, Italian types and Asian types, and um, there's cinnamon basil, and there's just so many amazing flavors out there. Uh, but often that is a solution when you have year in and year out, you have a, a targeted issue. Sometimes just finding a plant that has been bred to deal with that issue. Um, can be the solution. And I think this is a great opportunity too for us to share some wisdom that's already in the group here um, and just toss in the chat, you know, what varieties have you grown that you find um, do particularly well? Of course, we have uh, some folks tuning in from, from afar um, and a lot of folks tuning in from here. So especially ones that are adapted to our particular um, corner of the world. I think are, are really good. I'm trying to think what for us um, has done the best. Um, well, of course, we, we always donate plants to the library plant sale. And so those are a great place to um, the, the library plant sale. And Adama, we also um, sell some plants straight from our greenhouse. Um, and we give a lot to the plant sale too. So you can um, show up there on, when is it, Meg? It's um, late May. Um, and May those are 21st and 22nd. <laughs> thank you. May 21st and 22nd. Those are going to be the varieties that your um, local farmers and gardeners who produce those plants already know to be well adapted to our area. So that can be um, 
that can be a good way to do it. Uh, where to get Everleaf Basil? Johnny's Selected Seeds. They're the ones that sell those seeds where I've bought them. Uh, there may be other places, but that's that's where I've bought them from. Um, trying to think some other uh, well-adapted varieties for our area. Um, eggplant, I find tricky um, because it needs such warm temperatures, but I really like the variety Nadia. Um, so that, that could be one to look for that I think is pretty well adapted to our Northern climate. Um, and Sharon likes Prospera from Johnny's. That's another basil variety. Um, so that's done well, that's good. That's, yes, I'm, I've seen that variety before. I think that's another resistant one. So that's good to know um, that that one works well. Okay, we'll continue. I'm gonna talk for another minute or two just to close up, but continue to toss in the chat any varieties that you found that work really well, anything else particularly well suited to our area, or if you have a little tip, like this is such a good opportunity, like, oh my gosh, the transfer station has all these wood chips. If you need wood chips for your garden, that's the place to go. And that, that is a real tip, that is really true. And the wood chips are, are, are really um, a wonderful resource. Um, you can throw those in the chat too. Uh, and Barbara's asking if we do farm tours. Yes, we do. And um, I will maybe let Meg know next time we have one um, uh, to maybe share with the library list too, because um, we'll have one in the spring for sure for our CSA members. And, uh, and maybe we can share that out um, as well. Or just, I'll also put my email in here and feel free if you're wondering later in the, um, um in the season you want to come out and check out the farm uh just um feel free to get back in touch with me so that'll probably be probably i'm gonna guess um late may we'll probably do do one and then another one later in the season and then we do them you know occasionally for all kinds of different programs so um, the high school and those kinds of things um oh and we also have some coming up in the husatonic heritage walk um, you, if you've seen those um, thick brochures that have all kinds of wonderful opportunities around our area. So we'll be, we'll be doing one through that. Um, Susan Allen is wondering about crop rotation. Great question. You do want to move your vegetables around your garden. You don't want to grow the same thing in the same place year in, year out, because you're going to build up the soil diseases relevant to that particular plant. You're going to um, uh, build up pest pressure. If you have a lot of space, if you can rotate, I mean, my best advice is take your vegetable garden out of production every few years. If you can, if you have one space where you're growing vegetables and you can switch to another space, you know, between, you know, every three years, switch back and forth, that is the ideal. Of course, not all of us have that much space or the ability to do that, but that is the best to grow a cover crop for a few years in a space where you were growing vegetable plants is a great, a great way to do it. That said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about like, okay, you know, I have a, um, let's say five by five raised bed and I'm, um, and I grew my tomato plant in this corner last year and my basil plant in this corner last year, and I'm going to swap them. I wouldn't worry too. It's not so important that that, that change up, but the more diversity you have, if you can, if you don't have the ability to switch your garden location every few years, Another option is just to switch what you grow, you know, take a year off tomatoes. If you're starting to see a lot of disease build up, just take a year off those if you can't grow them somewhere else. Um, it, it can be hard to do, but um, that, that is a recommendation I have. And then Sharon says that DMR basil, um, Eleonora from Harris and high mowing. So those are, we got a lot of good basil varieties recommended. Okay, so again, I'm gonna um, repost in case anyone joined and missed it. I'm gonna repost our um, link to the handout that I mentioned. And again, the handout um, just sort of goes through all the different things that you want to identify about your, um, your site in order to have a successful vegetable crop. And um, 
and how you want to think about all the different factors relevant to growing your vegetable your your vegetable garden and um and then kind of how to make decisions about your garden so and then a glossary of all the different factors that you might might want to know so i'm going to post that there for anyone that missed it and you can review that later there's also a link to a little virtual farm tour in there that i i did one time and then i put in there that talks about different vegetable growing techniques um, and then i'm also going to link to our csa website so again um, we grow veggie organic veggies available um, through our csa in falls village and in sharon so that you um, you can help us by spreading the word about our CSA. We, we want to make sure that everyone knows that we have this wonderful access to healthy, fresh veggies, fresh organic veggies. Um, and yeah, and that's everything. Um, thank you so much, Meg, for organizing this. I, I feel so, you know, in this moment in time, one of the, the best things we can do is grow, um, grow our food and take care of our soil and um, be a part of communities that are sharing resources and sharing um, knowledge and and uh, and being in touch about um, about our food and our healthy veggies. So thank you so much for organizing this and thanks to all of you for for your vegetable gardening. And if anybody wants to, feels like they, there's something that they missed and they want to go back and watch the recording, there'll be a recording of the session. It'll be up on the library's YouTube page uh, probably by tomorrow. You can access the library's YouTube page um, from the upper right hand corner of our website, which is huntlibrary.org. Um, and Jana had mentioned our Home, Hunt's Homegrown Plant Sale, which is one of my favorite uh, fundraisers that the library does. It's May 21st and 22nd. The plant sale is, is our, one of our biggest fundraisers and we have all kinds of plants, perennials, annuals, flowers, vegetables, herbs, and garden accessories. And all the plants are grown by people who live around here. So they're, they're right for this climate. Um, and they've done well here. And Jana and Adama generously donate all kinds of vegetables and herbs, which is one of my favorite parts of the sale. So thank you so much, Jana, for taking the time and sharing your expertise with us. And thanks to everybody else um, for joining us. It looks like people are having a little bit of trouble with the Google Doc. So maybe Jana and I will figure that out and I can I email just, it over. Oh, you, I, just you, I just changed the settings, so you should be good to so, go. Yeah. Great, thanks. thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Jana. Bye, everyone. Bye.